Hello, welcome to the channel. My name is Matt. This is Bask in the Story, and today I'm joined by Sam from Sam Housens. Hello. And uh, we are touching on the second book of the Wheel of Time, The Great Hunt, which I think is that one. I'm not sure that side. Um, we've through book two, we did a video, um, a non spoiler on the, our own channels, and a full spoiler. There we go. For a full spoiler discussion on book one. So you can go back, I'll link in the description to those. Uh, and this is going to be, again, a full spoiler discussion on the second book and our thoughts on it. So, Sam, welcome. How are you? Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. The minor update that I have is that I've actually finished the next book, The Dragon Reborn. <laughs> but I want to, uh, I'm not going to spoil Matt on it because that would be incredibly unfair. Um, so anyone who has only been reading along with us and has only read either world and the great hunt you can be safe that there will be no spoilers for the dragon reborn um but we might spoil bits of the either world so if for some reason <laughs> you have read the great hunt but you haven't read either world beware <laughs> yeah yeah that would be an interesting way of approaching this this series <laughs> definitely uh, so yes, yeah, and I've not read any of the third book because I'm slightly behind, but I will be on it straight after after today. So um, let's start off. I suppose we start off with just um, your general thoughts on the second book, Sam. Because I know the first book you quite enjoyed. You well, probably enjoyed. I think it's fair to say uh, the first book. So still feeling high on the second book? Yeah, I think I preferred. I think the, I thought the second book was better. Um, and I think the thing that um, the big thing for either world was it was a real surprise. I was expecting to kind of struggle through it and to be kind of pushing through it until I got to the better books in the series. Because, like as we saw on that list, the either world was one of the lowest ranked. Uh, yeah. A lot of people will say it's one of the weaker books, um, and I was expecting like this will be a two or three star with potential. And then I ended up coming out with it like, oh, this is a four star and it's basically only a four star because the ending is extremely rushed and hard to understand. <laughs> um, yeah. And then coming into The Great Hunt, I do still think that Jordan rushes the end on The Great Hunt. I think that everything kind of happens right in the last couple of chapters. Um, but I think overall, the, the story w was better for me. I think there's kind of... Yeah more variety in the storytelling we get to spend more time with um Egwene, who was a character that i found interesting but not i don't know i felt like she needed a bit more like complexity in the first book okay. which she really gets yeah. in book two and then um yeah getting to see also introduced to these new cultures and new societies um so yeah i mean i was talking to a friend and said that i feel like the wheel of time is basically in every book they go to a place and then they're like this is why this place is messed up yeah. <laughs> um yeah. and yeah there is you got like this little travel mm. travel journal where we go to a place and meet new characters and this is this is what's wrong with this part of the world yeah and i think the one the one negative the one big negative that i had was that i felt like the game of houses stuff was like felt a bit forced um and that maybe that wasn't where think... jordan's forte was the like um dias de mar i think it's called game of okay, houses yeah, stuff yeah 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 it's just in carhain Car carhain yeah carhain yeah. Um, yeah where everyone's sort of playing a political game to mm. advance themselves okay yeah and i thought that that wasn't particularly well done that was like my biggest detractor when i reviewed the book okay. was that the and like as i said the ending is a little bit rushed nowhere near as rushed as eye of the world i think eye of the world literally the ending is like two chapters and they're short chapters whereas like the great hunt has quite has like a good build up and it has a good payoff to that build up i just feel like having now read the dragon reborn where i feel like he really nails it looking back at the great hunt it's a bit like oh well you know he had room to grow there yeah i think we have like a similar a similar progress on the second book as the first book in a sense i mean we have sort of this journey element at the beginning where we're traveling somewhere in this one we're hunting hunting for the horn and we're you know traveling and then we sort of get to a place and then all of a sudden we find this magical way of traveling really quickly vast distance without having to fill that gap in in storyline 
Mm. And then we're there, and then we have a very a few chapters just to to finish it off in a a grand finale. And I think the grand finale was better done. I think there was more build up to it, so you sort of see it coming as the end of the Eye of the World just came out of the blue, and it was just mm. like this is it. And suddenly there was all these other characters just appearing, and you're just like, I don't know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Or why you feel like the Forsaken is a prime example. Yeah, those, those are think, the big thing for me. Yeah. And I think for me, this one, I enjoyed this one more than the first one. So the first one was probably a, a three-star read for me with a lot of potential. I think we discussed that on the first video, but this one was better. I think for several reasons. One, it was definitely its own unique story. Mm. Uh, as the, the first one gets a lot of critique, but it, it's well known and, and Jordan's been very clear that it is there's certain having a um, homage tribute to uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Fresh of the Rings. There's a lot of connections there. And it was the odd the odd connection in this one. Like I think one of the, the pubs in maybe coming is called the Nine Rings. And in Lord of the Rings, the humans are given nine rings. Mm. Um so there's certain there's still little tweak, tweaks to it, but the story itself is just different and it's a very different um arc that we follow and it's very much a unique storyline. So I enjoyed that a lot more. I thought I thought the pacing in general was better uh, in this one. Uh, and that comes on to the ending as well, where the ending was better. I still think, as you say, it was a little bit quick um, mm. uh, to wrap it all up, but I still think it was it landed better than the first one. And I think I enjoyed some of the characters more in this one, and some of them I still think are terrible. Um, and we'll come on to the characters in a minute and we'll work through the list. I think we'll probably agree. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if there's any points of disagreement on some of the characters. Um, and I know you've got a viewpoint that's changed now you've read the third book as well. Yes. So that, that's good. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I think if we start, go to the prologue first, because mm. I really enjoyed this prologue. Like this, the opening of this book, and we go like right back to like the Dark One and all the Dark Friends, sort of mostly in disguise, but we suddenly get this image of the vast sprawl of dark friends mm. that exist within the world. And I thought that was really, as a setting to start the book, worked really well. I don't know what your thoughts were on the on the prologue element. Yeah, I think the big thing with the prologue that I take away is um, how, like you say, widely spread the dark friends are, how they're kind of in every strata of society. I'm pretty certain that there's clues that Shinarans are dark friends in that prologue. And there's also clues that there's an Aes Sedai as a, as a dark friend. And yeah. like that's, I think that's really good. And it's great foreshadowing for the the two big turns in this book, uh, which, you know, full spoiler discussion, where Ingtar and uh, Leandrin both betray the protagonists. Yeah. Um, Leandrin, in a way worse way, she sucks. Uh, <laughs> um... Um, but I think it's, uh, yeah, showing us the kind of the widespread nature of the Dark Friend stuff um, is really important for this book specifically. Because, like, in either world, they show us that Dark Friends are everywhere, but then they also tell you that Matt artificially draws the Dark Friends in with the dagger. So it's like, ah, oh, that's why, maybe that's why they're seeing all these Dark Friends. And in this book, Jordan's like, no, it's because they are literally everywhere. Yeah, yeah and literally everyone is in, like, the first book. We met a few, mm. but they were like they weren't they weren't real characters. They were sort of drop ins. Like they mm. appeared for a chapter or two and then tried to do the deed, failed and we moved on. As this one we had, as you say, some main characters that were throughout Ingtar being the prime example of that. Mm. And I think as you said, you know, for me the prologue just set out so nicely and even with the foreshadowing in the prologue, like I think with Ingtar and let's if we go into characters, and I think we'll start with Ingtar, because I think he is one of the the more fascinating characters in this, even though mm. we don't get his don't think we get his perspective to say we see him from others' perspective. But mm. his journey, or actually he's always been where he is, but going from perceived as this very loyal warrior um to actually turning out to be, you know, a dark friend and his desire and desperation to get hold of the horn again, we suddenly see from a different different angle. 
because we think it's just the loyalty of him trying to do what the Aes Sedai want him to do mm. and, you know, not fail them. But actually, there's the uh, the unseen element that actually he's got an ulterior motive, which mm. I thought was really well done. I didn't I didn't see that coming in, in any way, shape or form. I don't know whether it surprised you as much as it surprised me, but I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was surprised when the dark friend, Linus, was revealed. Um, yeah. But the interesting thing is, um, I was thinking back to a lot of previous scenes, and I was like, "Oh, this makes complete sense." Yeah. Like he was doing this X Y Z, and because he was a dark friend. And there's also a scene that I remembered where um, Perrin says that his helmet looks like Trolloc horns because he's got a okay. crescent moon on the top yeah. of his helmet, and it looks like um, Trolloc horns. There's a lot of foreshadowing of it. Yeah. If you are paying a lot of attention, which I think is <laughs> where we're going to go for the rest of the books, I think it's going to be yeah. like if you've paid attention, you'll already know what's happening. Yeah, and I think that is why we hear a lot of people saying they so much enjoy a second read because mm. they know what happens, so they can actually it's much clearer all this foreshadowing of what is actually happening. And yeah. obviously, reading it for the first time, we don't know where this story goes or what what's important and what's not so that's all for yeah. us in the future but it is it is fascinating to see so like the first book the main character really of this is rand mm. uh what were your thoughts on rand's journey from because at the end of the first book we've got him he's he's finally channeled we know he's a dragon reborn i don't think he per se knows he's the dragon reborn at that point at the end of the first book mm. uh but we then sort of enter this where he knows he can channel, he knows he's a danger to his friends and his close ones, etc., mm. etc. But he still has this connection to them, and then we carry on that journey. How did you find his journey through book two? I think that, um, the, I, you know, I was talking about how in Eye of the World, all of the main Emmonsfield characters have that kind of central conflict between who they are and who they want to be, or who they were. Yep. Um, and Rans is multiple fold in that, you know, <laughs> he is an Aielman, but doesn't want to be. He he yep. is the dragon, but doesn't want to be. He is a male channeler, but doesn't want to be. Um, and we get this kind of reluctant acceptance in this book, um, where he allows Moraine to proclaim him as the dragon reborn, and lets, you know, lets her use the dragon banner, um, and I think it's uh, you do get a few more like Brand. This is an incredibly stupid decision, but it's because he's going mad from being a male channeler. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it works really well. And I think that we the temptation of um, Celine, I think, is really important to his character in this book, and like kind of like going oh, because he's kind of given up on Egwene. Like, he has these childish feelings for her, but also, like, I said I don't marry. So he's like, yeah. well, I can't marry Egwene, so if I can't marry her. Uh, but then Celine comes along, and Celine is very tempting, and she's very beautiful, as Robert Jordan tells us every single time she's referenced. Um, but, <laughs> I th yeah, I think... I think Rand has, like, the big challenge in this one is, like, he kind of knows who he is, and um, he's reluctantly accepting it through this book. Like, yeah. the Dias Day Mar stuff is good as well, because he's like, no, I'm not part of the game, I'm not part of the game. And then, like, at the yeah. end, he's like, ah, oh, turns out I was a part of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, and I think it's interesting to see his, um, his change, where he doesn't want any of it, but then he becomes this leader. Mm. And he does, like, in, in a really small way. Like, uh, so with Hurin, he's like the the sniffer. Yeah. The sniffer, according to him. Um, and like how he then becomes, he's seen as this lord mm -hmm. by Hurin anyway, but he sort of takes on that role, especially in Karain, where, you know, that, that power struggle is always ongoing. He sort, mm. of, sort of develops into that role of being a leader and giving instructions and, you know, staying out plans. But there is also this very reckless side to him that we see like uh when they go to that 
the house, the, the really rich man's house in Clarain, and mm. there's a, the ways the, the horn has been taken through the ways, and he just goes and he just he knows there's a massive dark wind still somewhere in the ways, and it's really dangerous, but he just opens it up mm. carelessly without actually going to get really anybody to help. It's just, I think it's just him, uh, Louis Al, and Huron, maybe. maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think Huron's just the three of them. And I'm like, and then the dark wind is there, and he's just throwing magic at it, like hmm. just channeling the, the the one true source as much as possible to try and fight it. And he's just like, this guy's. There's definitely something no, going on with this guy. <laughs> yeah, he has no control at the moment. He's like slowly losing it. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, L'Oreal shuts the door, but you can start to see that that breakdown and him becoming more reckless and yet more responsible at the mm. same time and i think that's an interesting sort of dichotomy that he is leaning towards and we're seeing through his character arc and his eventual sort of acceptance of who he is and what one thing i do like and lan is not a big character in this book at all we have a little bit of lan he has like one, one fantastic scene right at the beginning and that's it <laughs> he has one fantastic and he also has a bit with moraine um mm around the servitude element which is an interesting comparison to later in the book where we get the uh, Domani and the servitude and slavery ownership mm. element so there's two bits so two bits for land and so one is the beginning bit where he's doing all the training um because rand is still in um Faldara. Faldara. yeah Faldara. uh so he's training him up to actually be able to use the heaven sword now that he's got a really this really fancy sword he better be able to do something with it mm. one i just love the little sentences that are the moves i can't yeah. remember them exactly but it's only like the cat saunters through the courtyard or something like that for this like blase walk um abs overconfidence and there's all these different ones i thought oh they're they're, they're a nice little touch of because they give they actually quite um create quite an image mm. um just these like really simple sentences of sword play um but then the bit of moraine that got me where she's like basically said effectively i'm gonna you know at some point i'm just gonna pass you on and i've already aligned who i'm gonna pass you on to in the ice to die when i go mm. or if i go um you know as if he's just a belonging rather than his own person i thought that was a really interesting point of view because even though he is her servant in the first book it seems much more, much more of a partnership mm. And I think it still is, but there's certainly that that power imbalance uh, between the two, which is quite came across quite interesting in that that second phase. But that, that's all we really see of him in those first two first bit and the middle bit. Mm. I don't know what you thought about him touching on land because he's not in it much this time. No, yeah, I think um, yeah, like you say, we don't we don't get much land, but I think that the little land we get goes a long way. Um, I really enjoy the um, the training mon stuff and the swordmaster moves, but I also yeah. really enjoyed him training Rand on how to speak to the Merlin. Yeah, he's like, do this, do this, do not do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to know something interesting? So, in book one, Rand is eighty percent of the POVs, so he has eighty percent of page time. Yeah. But in book two, he only has 53%. Okay, so, so just it, over half. Yeah, it feels like the whole book is Rand again, yeah. but I feel like we do actually get more of the other characters than I yeah, we remember. Yeah, we get a lot more of... We get a little bit of Moraine, not much. Not enough. Of, yeah, <laughs> but we get more of Egwene and Nynaeve. Mm. A point or two, we get more of a tiny bit of Perrin, I think. Yeah, I think the way less Perrin than last time. Yeah. But the the thing I liked about um, just quickly jumping back to Rand, my th my other mm. little mini theory was because you know in book one she says to Rand that like you should do what I tell you to do because I'm a channeler because I'm an Aes Sedai, and I was like, yeah. oh, is that what's going on with Huron? Is he like the more time he spends with Rand, the more uh, okay. he like feels subservient? And I thought that might be an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, that's like my mini theory. I'll be interested to see if it pans out. So yeah, no, that's an interesting one. So let's okay, let's let's 
the score on the, the other Emmons fielders. So we've got, mm. we've, we've touched on Rand. Uh, Perrin doesn't have a huge amount to do in this book, from my memory. I don't remember him much he, in this book. He has 4% of this book, according to the wiki, Wheel of Time wiki that I have open in front of me. There you go. Whereas he That's has 12% of the previous book. So yeah. he's actually lost quite a lot of screen time. Yeah. And I think most of that, honestly, is because he goes off with Ingtar when Rand goes to the other world and the book just kind of continues to follow Rand and we just kind of ignore what's yeah. happening with Perrin. Yeah. Um, as you say, there isn't really anything happening with Perrin. He's still very much like, don't want to be a wolf, can do this wolf stuff, but I don't want to. Um, yeah. He's he doesn't accept it in the way that Rand does in this book. He's very much like, I'm going to um, like lie about what I can do, about being a sniffer. He, said, he lies and says he's a sniffer, and Ingtar's like, look, I'm just going to say you're a sniffer. <laughs> Which was quite good. Um, yeah, at least they understand, they'll accept that. The people will, the, my soldiers will accept that because they've had one before. So Yeah, and I think um, Ingtar says he knows Elias. Is that Am I mad for that? I feel like he references. Yeah, I think there's a connection. There's something about because you find yeah, out in this book that about um, wolf brother, yeah. yeah, you find out that Elias was a warder in this book, don't you? That's yeah. that's the big reveal about Elias is that he was a warder. Yeah. Um, which kind of explains some stuff. I definitely want to see more of that character and get delved more into that world. Um, yeah. The Wolf Brother stuff is really interesting, and uh, not to uh, not to be that guy, but it does get a lot more interesting in book three. <laughs> Not to be that guy, but mm. <laughs> so so yeah. So Perrin, a bit of a nothing really. This character, we get very little uh, from him. Mm. Uh, let's move on to continuing to be the worst character of the series. Uh, my namesake, Matt. I think uh, yeah, I think he's the worst in this book. He's worse because he has like less screen time, but all the screen time he has is wasted. <laughs> it's all yeah. bad. Yeah, and I still feel. I mean, obviously you're or through book three so you you know but i think he is almost deliberately built in the story as he is because jordan's given him this issue with the dagger and therefore it's changed him completely we never see his point of view we never get any development from him throughout the book so we don't really know who he is we know what the people said about him at the beginning mm -hmm. and we see him under the influence of of the dagger and that that's really it and mm. we don't get any more from him i didn't feel any more for him in this book than i did in the last book and i didn't feel anything from the first book so mm. i think that there's um i think a lot of this book i was kind of annoyed with him being it being annoying i mean he's worse in book one he is a lot worse because yes. that you the, when you see him through ran's eyes he, he's just very annoying yeah. um i think there will be a fantastic discussion for us to have in a few weeks time when we've read thread dragon reborn <laughs> um because there's a lot going on with matt that you don't see because we don't have his pov yeah so um when we get to that book i think there's a big i think there is a big matt discussion to have and i would imagine it will be one of the first things we talk about yeah um, well I'm, I'm assuming it must be because so many people tell me that he is their favourite character from the series, and two books in, I'm like, he is the worst character in the book. I can't think of anybody worse. Yeah, by far him. as well. It's not even close. But, yeah, it's not even close. There's not. There's not like somebody else who's. I think I'd rather hang bottom. out with Balsamon. Yeah, exactly. It's just at least he's, at least he's bringing something to the game. Warmth. Uh, it's just he's very. He's on fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah. So. There must, I'm, you know, I'm well aware there must be a huge change. And I think, obviously, we'll get rid of, hopefully we'll get rid of the dagger in the next book. Well, uh, I'll tell you now, there is a chap, there are multiple Matt POV chapters where I laughed out loud. And I've never laughed yeah. at these books before. Uh, well, and I'm, there's literally I'm two or three, I, two or I three times laugh. where I literally was like, ha, huh, while reading it. So, okay. So, I'm going to move from probably one of my least favourite character to one of my favourite characters so mm. far. And that's actually Nynaeve. Mm. So She has the best scene I, in the book, I think, with the which, which scene the is test. The, the test. test yes, I think absolutely. the test is the best part of the book. Yeah. Yeah. 
I absolutely adored that 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 scene. And it, it you know, the fact that the the challenges that she comes across are what they are, that these fears so the first the first one is, you know, a forsaken, it's pretty what you'd expect, I suppose. Um, but then the second two are just just get to the heart of who Nynaeve is and her sort of her loyalty to her her people then in a sense and that fear of not being able to fulfill that loyalty was i thought really well done mm. uh, and but we also get from that scene more intrigue into who she is and what she is mm. because it goes into the bit around um that when they go through the arches for the test into this other place where they're sort of shown their fears and have to face up to their fears and escape. But it's a very limited opportunity to escape. You'll only see the arch. It only appears once and then you'll be lost forever if you don't take it. Is, you know, she's warned not to use, not to channel while she's in there because anybody who has channeled before, before has basically lost all connection mm. with the one true power when they've come out. And yet, Nynaeve is able to channel mm -hmm. And not only able to channel, but seemingly quite powerfully able to channel um, in the sense of, I think it's in the third test. Mm. So the first one is the Forsaken. The second one is she's in Emmons Field, is that right? And then mm. she has to leave. Um, she has to leave it, even people. though it's in the wisdom there has been killing people off. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And she can't help. She has to leave them because the arch appears. Mm. And it's their desperation and her being able to help. And then the third one is her and Lan mm. are married and have a family and she has to leave him. And that dream of a life that she may have had. Uh, but the arch appears in there and she doesn't take it and mm. then it disappears. And yet then she's able to channel and sort of recreate the arch so she can escape. Mm. And she still has a connection with the one power. So it just had that intrigue of how powerful is she and why is she so powerful and what what is her role going forward because it's very much a a a fate you know the the, the wheel is fate and there's, there's a, a thread for everybody's lives that you sort of mm. are forced to follow um but uh but what her place was in that and i i i i think she was the most for me the most interesting character mm in this book i think it's only the one that stuck with me the most and i think that 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 scene of her doing the accepted test become one of the accepted in the ice die was was probably my favorite in the yeah. book as well and it's my favorite scene in the first two books combined yeah. honestly i really uh, i really really like really rated it um you know the christmas carol -y aspect of it like you know present pos present past possible future yeah. Um, yeah, I just really I think um, Nine is a very interesting character in terms of like how she can only channel when she's angry, um, and like uh, how I remember she brings something back, doesn't she, from the vision, which everyone's mm. like, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> like she brings something back <laughs> from the test, and they're like, that's not possible um, because yeah. it's just a vision. Um, but it that also I feel like gives a little bit more credence to the like multiverse aspect of yeah. Wheel of Time that we, we see a lot of in this book with Rand travelling to the other universe through the portal stone. Yeah. yeah, and that was an interesting one. So that, let's make a little jump here because mm. that leads me on to another thought process. So with regard to the portal stones, I, I love the alternate dimensions, the, the options and the what-ifs. Yeah, these 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 options were, were really fascinating, and also we meet Celine, mm. the beautiful Celine. She's she's beautiful. Because that's, that's the only know. descriptor. Yeah, that's the only descriptor we can use for her. That she is very beautiful. Um, yeah, that that I mean, that was frustrating. But <laughs> I think I think we got the point. <laughs> she's quite yeah. an attractive lady. Uh, anyway, uh, putting that to one side, I think. I don't know when you figured out who she actually was and that she was Lanfear. 
I don't think I figured it out until they revealed it, but I, I okay, knew she was so, shady. Like, instantly. Yeah, so I, I was I, like, this I, woman's I, shady. I figured out, well, I would say figured out. I was pretty sure that she was Lanthea uh, before she randomly announces to Min that she is, which I found strange that she just announced that at the end. But beside that. Could Min have seen it anyway, that, so. Sorry? Yeah, maybe she would have Maybe Min could have told, maybe, found out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was just interesting that she made that announcement. It sounded, it just felt a bit weird. It's been so um, secrety, secretive mm. throughout up to that point. But anyway, but I sort of figured out, I was pretty sure that she was Lanfear, which led me to the thought process of, I don't know whether you thought about this, but was that her prison that Rand let her out of? Mm, maybe. Because we don't was, see well, her saw... in the real world until Rand yeah. finds her in the other universe. And then she is able to come to the other universe when Rand brings her out with the portal stone. So yeah. maybe. I mean, they're all... Maybe she's a, the... She could be the Lanfear from that universe, if we're thinking about it that way around as well. Because yeah. the Dark That's One true. is the same Dark One in all universes. But yeah. the Forsaken, we don't know if the Forsaken, there's only one of them in the multiverse. There could be multiple. Oh, wow. So we could have two landfields running around mm. in their books. So, yeah, I was just wondering. Twice whether, the beauty. You know, just, it... <laughs> oh, God, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just it just made me think about, because obviously you've got the seals, the seals breaking and sort of showing them escaping. And it just made me think of, because she doesn't, she doesn't channel to release herself mm. from where she is. So either she channeled to get herself in there because you have to channel at the portal stones to actually be able to use them, or she was put there. And the fact that it was quite a desolate place with no other mm. people, just these weird groms uh, running around. It just, it just a thought process that struck me was, was that actually a prison and did Van just release one of the forsaken yeah, it could definitely into like, because the, the yeah. all the Forsaken are Aes Sedai, aren't they? They're all extremely powerful channelers. So yeah, I believe so. I think I'm pretty certain that that's what they've said in the first couple of books that they're, yeah. they're all, um, they're all like the most powerful channelers from the Lewis Theron time of mm. times, or like the most powerful evil ones. Yeah. So. But I also, okay. I don't know about you, but I got kind of the feeling that Celine wasn't 100% Team Dark One. It feels like she was more out for herself than mm. um, I was expecting. Yeah, I definitely I definitely got the impression that she was playing her own angle. Mm. Whatever that. Oh, that's frozen. Oh, you frozen, but you're back. So she's oh, playing right. her own good, angle. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely that she was, yeah, yeah, channeling and doing her own her own thing, whatever that may be. I had no idea what that is, but she's mm. definitely doing her own her own game. I think that's led, why it led me to sort of the Lanfear thought process. Um, right, let's jump back to the Airmen's Fields. So we haven't touched mm. on. Um, we touched briefly on Egwene. Yeah. Um, how did you find Egwene? Because we got some more of her and her becoming a novice mm. in the eyes of I. So um, and her disastrous bit in towards the end. Yeah. I mean I first off I'd like to make a extreme a, a very obvious complaint that Robert Jordan, I know you're dead, but if you're gonna have two characters that are gonna interact constantly and be best friends and in every single one of each other's chapters, don't call them Egwene and Elaine. You can choose the names. It's completely up to you. They don't it's not like if you no, in your school class wrong. if there are two Sams. Like no, You're absolutely no. wrong. You're absolutely wrong, Sam. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, and that was it what it willed. <laughs> he had no choice in this matter. I feel like he just had names in a hat that all began with E and he was like, <laughs> Let's do this. Like this there's Lan, Lan Fear, Leandrin, yeah. Leanne. Yeah. <laughs> there's another Leanne name as well. There's a fourth there's oh, a third I Sty. That has an Ali in it. Yeah. There's also Alana yeah, and Elaine? Anaya, Aes Sedai. Yeah, oh, there's too many. There's too many. L yeah. L sounds ridiculous. But yes. 
but yeah, yeah Egwene. Egwene's my Egwene in like book one and two is probably my favorite Emmons fielder. I think that she had, especially with the Sean Chan slavery stuff at the end yep. of book two, I found that to be the most that's like the most hardship that any of the characters that are POV characters have gone through. Like Matt's obviously having a terrible time, but we don't know. He just seems like a dick. But, you know, Elaine was literally forcibly enslaved and yep. abused, which is, um, which obviously is a much, much more interesting, not more interesting, but like the PTSD and the like, the horror of that situation, I think is like the worst thing that happens to anyone in these books. And I really liked, yep. I like how they showed that. I like how they were very, like how Jordan gave us quite a few POV chapters in Falm. Um, and I love when uh, the joy that she gets when she's like, oh, the bracelets work on you as well. Or well, the collar even. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's good. Like, that's proper, that's proper good. I was expecting that, that it. Was, that was a really nice touch. Cathartic. Uh, it was the fact that actually... Yeah, actually, you can, you know, wear this bracelet that's trained around my neck because you can also channel. Mm. Uh, so this works the other way around. And you know what? Screw you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was definitely one of the worst hardships. I mean, that was pretty brutal. Mm. Just the... Because you, you sort of come across... Sean Channer really interesting i think interesting is the right word because we have this side of them where they are the slave owning side where there is the, you know the brutality of slavery mm -hmm. um literally you know channel through um this bracelet and collar but then they are quite relaxed I was going to say egalitarian but that might not be right but with the rest of the community that's under their mm. ownership effectively so once you've sworn your allegiance they're like okay no. carry on all right <laughs> unless, unless you can channel then yeah you can carry on with your life pretty normally mm. it's not and really it seems like major, but... they're not like hunting down people who can channel because elaine and nynaeve live there for it feels like Egwene is there for a long time like well she is isn't she because yeah. it takes them Rand loses months on the journey yeah four months yeah. yeah so she's been a slave for quite a long time yeah the one thing that I also thought was cool about the farm section which isn't really Egwene related is that the ship captain that they buy uh their escape transport yeah. on is Bail Domon the the captain yeah, with yeah, the yeah. Aes Sedai seal and I yeah. was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, like a nice connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I did enjoy seeing Domon again. He was nice to see. Absolutely. But yeah, the, the whole the whole slavery, I just find that sort of colonization slavery piece really interesting that we get, you know, two sides. Like if they capture, you know, Aes Sedai or women who can channel, then the brutality of that and the way they use them mm. is horrific. And the colonizers... And yet the people they colonize, as long as they swear allegiance, they don't seemingly have to do much more mm. to then be allowed to live effectively their normal normal lives. It's it's an interesting very, yeah. Piece that is, is being built there. So yeah, so that was really interesting. I did find that really interesting. And that sort of also that piece of actually, you know, we're very back to the Lan Moraine element where Lan is invisibly chained yeah 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 to to moraine or whoever she decides to pass him on to because mm -hmm. there is that ownership element there as well so even if you're not going through that same physical torment that Elaine, um see i'm getting mixed up now between elaine and egwene <laughs> uh, egwene went through there's still mm -hmm. that that ownership element so i think the other one to i think that's all the Emmons fielders. One thing, just on the, I'm just thinking out while we're talking about Aes Sedai and channeling. Obviously, when Rand goes into Karain, there's that massive statue. Mm. Um, 
and he's like attracted to this big sphere that like starts. Yeah, the sun. I, I don't know if it actually says it's glowing, but I imagine it glowing. Um, and he's really attracted to it because he's like, and it turns out that it's something that can really channel. It's the power it's a Sar it's... Angrial, isn't it? That's it's... how you say it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's how so, I say and it. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and there's one like that one is like the the male one. There's a female one somewhere else in the world, and you know if they're both channeled at the same time, it will break the world. Hmm. Fascinating. But what was really interesting is that they talked about there's not many female Aes Sedai who are powerful enough to actually channel the female one. As we mm. know, Rand is likely powerful enough to channel the male one because, I mean, he's done quite amazing things already without any real knowledge of what he was doing. Mm. Uh, but it touches on, I think, Moraine. Um, so there's Moraine, there was the Amarillion seat, but then they mentioned that there was three others in training. Mm. And I, my assumption, therefore, is that is Egwene, Elaine, and um, Nynaeve. Mm. Would be the three I don't training, know if Elaine I don't know. is powerful. No, but it just um, it said three in training. I was just mm -hmm. like, I instinct. I mean, obviously, Nynaeve we know is powerful because, mm -hmm. as we mentioned earlier, so that was an obvious one. But I was like, does that mean the other two as well, or who yeah. are these three in training? It's just a bit of a throwaway comment. I was like, hmm, interesting. I've got a lot of time for Elaine. She's like my favorite minor character in, yeah. and I guess she's more of the main cast member, but like. I don't feel like she's got enough screen time for how good of a character she is. Like yeah. a lot of the a lot of the book, she's like clearly knows the correct and right thing to do, <laughs> but just like let Egwene and Nynaeve debate it out, and like eventually come to the same conclusion that she had. Um, because obviously she's been trained from birth to be queen, so there's a very interesting thing going on there. Um, also, I can't remember, I need to, I'm waiting for it to be revealed in the books, the thing that I guessed about Moraine being the rightful okay, queen yeah. of, of yeah. Andor, um, and I want to see how they're related, because they, if, if Moraine is the rightful queen, she has to be like her aunt or something like that? Yeah, I, yeah, I would assume aunt or something like that. And also, how old is Moraine? Cause well, that's true, could be... I think I think Moraine is probably could be a great aunt, I suppose. I think she's quite old. I think that there's. I th I think that she is older than Morgays, like she's okay. the generation of the similar generation. So I think she's like you know an older person. Obviously, the Aes Sedai are ageless until yeah. they get to a certain point. Um. Yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff to think about there. I think there's a lot. There's a lot of hidden hints in the background mm. on uh, for that specific thing that I've been looking for, um, and I'm like, oh, because in book one, there's loads of it in book one. There's basically none in book two, but yeah. like when the I think there's a like a, like a one off the hand comment about succession, and I was like, oh, they're gonna say something, <laughs> <laughs> but we don't even know uh, her we will surname. See. We'll keep so, our eyes peeled. Yeah. Mm, keep our eyes keep to die peeled. peeled. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. So, um, so there's a couple of other Aes Sedai. Mm. Uh, we meet, obviously, the Amelin seat, but... Um... Did you know she was a fishing from a fishing village? <laughs> I don't know if that was clear by the fact that yeah. literally I mean, I every sentence admit, has a fishing metaphor. Yeah, um, I mean, Robert Jordan has this amazing ability to really ram home <laughs> an image he's trying to create of an individual by using the same terms over and over and over again uh whenever they seem to appear uh, she literally which... says like something about fishing or boats or fish yep. in every yep. single sentence and it's so funny like every time it happened i was there i was like cracking up laughing whenever she's like oh well you know you got a net some real wins and you're like come on <laughs> come on Suan." This is below you. You don't have to uh, do this. Yeah, exactly. You've not been a fisherman for like 70 yeah. years. <laughs> no, it has to be. has mm. to be. Once a, once a fisherwoman, always a fisherwoman. That's the way it is. But yeah, I mean, she was fine. I, li I like the fact that her, Moraine, and Verin. Yeah, Verin. All know that Rand is dragonly born. They have their own view of the prophecy of what has to happen. 
mm. and that they therefore won't gentle him because he has to do what he has to do. I like it. Uh, then. I like that they're like. Well, I guess we have to trust Varen because she's worked it out, <laughs> and they're just they're just yeah, incredibly just lucky that she's on side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did like the way we've started to see a bit more of what how the ICD ICDI are mm. structured. Like we've got different colours, um, and what that actually means, and how they have their own objectives. Mm. within it but they're all sort of they're all working towards the sort of the same thing but they had to take different approaches approaches to it so you've got mm. like the, you know the blues which the amelin is and moraine is and they're like the politicians very, of the Aes Sedai, yeah, which i thought political. i was like oh this is this is interesting stuff i like also the yeah. you know like the oath where they can't tell a lie yes um i was like oh this is good and like her being the politician class and she can't tell a lie and everyone's like well you can't trust what she says <laughs> it's like but yeah, she exactly. told you she can't lie to you yeah she literally can't lie but mm. it doesn't mean the truth th means what you think it means yeah, yeah. exactly interpretation really is... interesting i think moraine is such an interesting character that you we get a very sparing amount of especially in in this book there's not much moraine in it but like yeah the bits we get are worthwhile and they make me more curious about her as a character. Yeah. Yeah. I I am very curious about Moraine. I think also I mean, look at the other the other so look like the red Aja 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 mm. Aja. Aja, yeah. Um, I need to look at the glossary at the back because it's got pronunciation in the back. I, I listened to the Rosamond Pike audiobook. So oh, okay. You've she's great. So we've got um Leandrin who's like I mean, she is classic villain. She's a proper piece of work. Yeah, yeah, and I like the fact that we know she's a baddie. Yeah. Or we're pretty sure she's a baddie, and obviously she's a baddie, but they don't know that she's a baddie. She just seems like a, you know, an obsessed red mm -hmm. Ija who wants all men dead, well, all channeling men dead, because that's mm. understandable because they will break the world otherwise. Um, but actually, we know, and this is where it goes back to the prologue, where you get that that feeling, and you start to go, okay, yeah, obviously, this is this is the baddie, mm -hmm. and she is that classic classic baddie who. I mean, it's, it's one of those bits in the story where the, where she takes um, Elaine, Nynaeve, and Egwene out, and yeah. oh yeah, no Min, whichever anyway, all of them out into the ways and it's interesting obviously like in the way she says oh don't worry about dark wind mm. i know how to i basically know i know how to defeat that or <laughs> whatever you're like okay interesting do you, of course or, you do love <laughs> yeah exactly are you just lying to us or do you have some tricks up your sleeve because yeah is the dark because that was the other bit about the dark wind is it actually manageable because why is it seemingly guarding the entrances that rand is trying to get into mm. to get across so is it more controlled than we think it can be or we are led to believe mm. but then she also just takes them to the Sean Chan to become to become slaves and it's just like yeah you are the ultimate classic villain of the piece and we know it they don't know it but you just go why are you why are you following this woman <laughs> and you go no, no say no mm. <laughs> don't all go she's so clearly no. shady like yeah, exactly um but then there's that that, that built-in element of trust because they're like well the black Aja don't exist like maybe yeah. she's not got the same motivation as us but we're all broadly on the same path yeah. and then you're like oh no actually she's just evil yeah. um she's she not misunderstood lie. she is evil yeah. and she um, can't lie because yeah. she's taken the oath but again doesn't mean she's telling you exactly what you think she's telling you mm. I, I do i do really love that dynamic that actually they can't they don't lie, but actually what they say can be misconstrued or have alter, alternate, you know, meanings and yeah. interpretations. I think it, that is really what I, I think that will build as well as we go through the story, because I think that's, that is a really nice element yeah. to the, the storytelling of it. Because I like that you find out that the brown Arja and the red Arja don't have warders, because the brown yep. Arja would just like forget about them. And the Red Arja are like, well, we hate all men, so obviously we don't have warders. Yeah. And then the, is it the Greens just make up for everyone by having multiple? They have multiple, yeah. 
<laughs> so it all bounces out in the end. Yeah, I do like we're getting a bit more of, of the magic uh, and that as well. Mm. Um, so who haven't we touched on? I think we haven't touched on uh, Louis a- L'Oreal. L'Oreal. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's kind of still around. Yeah. Like he's still around. He's still a happy-go-lucky chap, just uh, exploring the world. He's a great counterpoint to Rand. Who who he spends the entire book with because Rand is like young and impetuous, and um, you know, angry and emotional. Whereas Loyal is very very like chilled. Yeah. And so he makes a really good counterpoint, and I think he, by being the opposite of Rand, helps Rand stand out a lot. Mm-hmm. And it kind of pushes Huron into that relationship with Rand of like lord and servant. Um, however, I would like to see some more loyal stuff. We get the one scene when they go to Stedding Sofu and he's terrified yeah. they're going to make him go home or that they're going to marry him off. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was good. Um, I did like that. that. That sort of harked back to what we discussed in the first video about uh, where the balance of power lies, the patriarchy mm. and matriarchy. And I liked the little bit about, you know, Rand sort of realising through what Loyal was saying that actually it was the women of Emmons Field mm. who really controlled things and who actually had sort of put him and Egwene together. Yeah. It was their, he didn't even think it was about their it, match. Yeah. He hadn't even thought about it. He thought it was, you know, they'd asked his dad and his dad, but actually it was all sort of manipulated or, you know, controlled mm. and you know, where the power really lies. And it is very much a matriarchal a lot of the societies seems to have a matriarchal leaning mm. uh, within that. Even the Sean Chan have an empress. Yeah. Um, so again, so but yeah, I do I do like Laurie. It would be nice to see more of him and more from his his viewpoint as well. But he is a good, as you say, a good counterpoint to the brashness, rash, rashness of Rand. Mm. I think there's only two characters I've got left that I want that I think of are Tom. Yeah. Who comes back? Poor lad. He didn't die. He's still alive. He has he a made terrible, wish he was dead, a terrible to be time in this book. Oh my goodness, that is. I, I I like. I do like Tom. He's he is up there. I've got I mean, a lot of time for Tom. Mm. Yeah. He's not been a major. I like, I liked him in the first book. I like him. What we see him in the second book. Mm. Uh, I like we learn more about his his family and why his, you know, very anti Isodai. But he has sort of mm. mixed feelings because he also knows that his. His nephew, isn't it? Who could channel was still a danger to everybody else, probably. Mm. Though he wasn't maybe as big a channel, wasn't didn't necessarily be sort of gentle quite so quickly, and obviously that led to his death. Mm. But yeah, does Van turning up in his life really just screw him <laughs> over again? I mean, poor old Tom, he's already got a oh, limp, it's just horrific. Like. In the first book, he has to like almost sacrifice himself. Yeah, he has to babysit these two idiots. idiots. Yeah, and then they then turn up in the second book, and he's actually living a fairly good life. Yeah, like he's making money, he's performing, he's got a young lady who's deeply in love with him, and he's very affectionate for, mm. and she's training up to to perform as well. And then Rand comes back, and he's just like the world just ends for him. It's just horrific, you know. I, I just, I just really feel for him. I'm just like, mm. I was just like, what does he do now? That's, that's, what is next for him? Because it, that can't be the end. He's obviously going to do something else. But it was just like, this is, this is dreadful. Revenge is on the air for Tom. I'm yeah. Sure. I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of book three is about the fallout from book two in a way that that isn't really the case with book two to book one like there's not that many negative consequences of what happens in eye of the world but like a lot of people go uh yeah a lot of people go uh, have some quite rough times in book two and that character like jordan doesn't sweep it under the rug um so when you read book three you let me know how you feel about it because i think i thought it was very well done yeah, because there's definitely, as you say, like, I mean, the two that stand out, Egwene and Tom, yeah. really stand out as they're going to have some issues. 
going mm. forward. Um, so that'd be interesting to see. The only other one that we've not touched on who's actually quite an interesting character is Fane. Mm. Who, I wish um, we got more of him in this book. Because um, he's he gets quite he actually gets quite a few POV sections, which is very mm. interesting. And you get to see the um so he's kind of like possessed in the first book and then yeah. he's kind of sort of come through the other side of it where we get to him here um but it also feels like that there isn't you know the original pardon fame that was the friendly merchant that used to go to Emmons field before he became a dark friend like was that person ever real was he always a dark friend is this new kind of psychopathic leader of dark friends? Is this the real pardon fame? So yeah, there's a lot of questions yeah. to be answered. And I found his character very interesting. And because of the evolution of like the golem to this actual genuinely sinister villain, I thought was really good. Yeah. And he's really stepped up. Like he's mm. gone from this, yeah, this, yeah, golem esque figure who's sort of run down and desperate to this very powerful individual mm. who's just stabbing and pinning shades to doors, just mm. who are like who have been sort of this epitome of fear. And he just, yeah, just killing them, which is, is like the step up of his. His sort of the threat level, level. Of, yeah. Threat level, yeah. Thank you. His step or his threat level is just dramatically increased, and where that goes from there, and also like, what is he now? Mm. You know how how does he sort of fit in? Because yes, he was a dark friend, but obviously he's been impacted by Shadar, the Gotha City, the darkness there as well. And he's sort of this combined evil entity. So. He's really interesting. I think I want to know more. And then we get this bit where he goes to the Sean Chan and sort of sort of tries to set Rand up mm. to be killed, but it doesn't really work the way he wants because the Sean Chan are more knowledgeable than he thought they were. Mm. And they can just open the chest and take the horn and the dagger out without really thinking about it. Yeah. So and he's still got this connection to the dagger like Matt does. So it's he's He's an interesting character. I just I would like to be built more on that because he's become this almost a bigger threat than the Dark One himself in this book. Mm. He's in a the physical book, threat, isn't he? Whereas yeah. the Dark One is like metaphysical almost. Like yeah. the threat of the Dark One is like the threat that they might someday come. Whereas Padden Fane is there and he's doing shit. <laughs> he's yeah. he's killing people. Yeah, and he's and he's powerful, and mm. he is an influence on the world now. As Balsamon in the first book did have an influence on the world through the dreams he was, you know, killing things, but not really people, but rats mainly. Um, but in, in this one, obviously, we have the big battle at the end of the first one. So, sort of, mm. is he dead? No, is the answer. Um, the dark one's not dead. <clears throat> and then in the second one, we have this, you know. Pad and Fane becomes this the the evil to be fought, which is is really interesting from his development. So I think we should probably talk about the ending. Mm. And you know what we haven't talked about is Ooh, the horn yes, of the Lear. We haven't talked about the horn, the, the, the great hunt for the horn, and we've not really mentioned it. Uh, at all. I love that but they. Maybe we should. <laughs> I love that they talk about the great hunt in book one and like how it's a big legendary thing and how they've been doing it for thousands of years. And, like, the Shinarans just had it. They just had yeah. it the whole time, which is very funny. Um, the fact that they have just had it. Um, and then Pardon Fane's like, oh, yeah, I've got this super cool horn, but obviously I can't blow it. And, like, no one can blow it. And then just at the end, Matt blows it. Yeah. Um, and the fact that it summons the ghost army of their King Arthur, Arthur Hawkwing, is very good. Um, I did not expect a ghost army. Um, I thought that was quite cool and it's a great way to even the odds for Rand when he's fighting you know an army yeah but there's seven of them uh, yeah pardon me but yeah very uh, really interesting 
item, magical item, and I love the the I like the lore that it's like this big mythical thing that everyone's been hunting for for decades, and just literally like Ingtar just had it, he just had it the whole time, and I I genuinely think that's very funny. That yeah. actually comes yeah. off again as well in future books that people are still oh, hunting yeah. for the horn. Yeah, and I love the hunt is taking place right down south. Yeah. In completely the wrong part of the world. But mm. that's where we all start. Is it Ilian? Everyone starts at Ilian. Mm. There's a hunt which is completely the wrong end of the world to actually start your hunt. But anyway, yeah, absolutely. I think the the undead, it, it calls the undead and we get these these great heroes of mm. Hawkwing's era is is really good and works well. Uh, I think the final battle of Rand is good and the sort of the sheathing of the sword mm. as it's so called going back to the old terminology um, I mean obviously the, the foreshadowing of that right at the beginning you know when he's teaching is an element that we assumed was going to come back again at the end but it did again it did feel a little bit rushed um, the ending sort of to wrap it up and there's mm. so much there's actually so much happening the difference I think the difference between the first book the ending of the first book felt rushed but not when I look back at it, a lot happened, but only really with Rand. Yeah. I think nothing else. So Rand suddenly did all these amazing things, and it was like, how? The second book, there was actually quite a lot going on, because mm. you had, you know, Nynaeve and Min and that trying to sort of master this escape mm. um, and get Egwene out of her, her slavery, which then turned into sort of, you know, chaining these other people to the wall and just leaving them there mm. and wishing them luck which I quite liked um, let's hope your friends don't turn on you because yeah. they will Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> which was a nice ending and obviously trying to run off to the ship and then you've got Rand and um, you know Ingtar sort of sacrificing himself at the end as well and you've got all these there was quite a lot packed in Yeah. actually the last three chapters to try and get it wrapped up and it did it just felt a little bit rushed but Actually, there's a lot happening, and I quite enjoyed the ending, even so. Yeah, I think I think it was a big improvement on the first book. I, the one thing that I wanted that I don't know whether I we actually get it is um, the um, the motivation for Ingtar to be a dark friend. Mm. Um. Uh, so yeah. I want to know, like, yeah. I'd like to know a bit more. Why? Um, I wonder if it's saying it here. Oh, that's a huge spoiler. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to do it's that. It's always dangerous, that is, Livia. Yeah, I shouldn't have Googled it. <laughs> to be fair, I didn't expect a spoiler about a completely different character as oh, part of uh, Ingtar's Very page. Real. Okay, uh, so yeah, we don't, we don't. And we think we get... We don't. I think that's probably why it becomes more of a surprise. Mm, um, yeah. Although the clues think, are all there, and I think that yeah. when I when it happened, when I thought back through the book, I was like, oh yeah, this makes complete sense. Like all the times he disagrees with Rand, and it's like, no, yeah. we have to do this. No, we have to do that. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And, yeah, and I think that's what I'm excited about about the future books is I'm excited about the way Jordan sets things up. Yeah. I think it's a weird, it's kind of a weird thing to say that 1,200, 1,300 pages, 1,400 pages, whatever I am now into this, mm. this series, which is a lot of pages, may not be huge numbers for fantasy readers, but it's still a lot of pages. That is still very much a, a setup. A lot ha has happened, but it feels like there's so much more mm. to come, which, to be honest, it's the beating of this when there's another 13 books, but you know, it, there's so much world building that's going on. There's so many clues to more world building. There's mm. there's foreshadowing within the books that happens, and there's lots of things in the books that intrigues you as to what will happen next. Nynaeve being a prime example. What is her role? What is her mm. power? Same with Egwene. What is her Egwene? What is her power? What is her um, future mm. thread in the great weaving of the wheel? You know, and how does it all? And I think the other one I don't think we actually talked about was Min. Yeah, and how. I mean, everyone loves Rand yeah. in the book, which I don't really see the appeal myself, but other than he's tall, everybody likes someone over six foot. I mean, he's, he's over seven he's foot. Tall, he? so he's, 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 he's a, a red tall, guy. he's very pale. Yeah. 
The fact exactly. that they talk a lot about how pale he is is very funny. It's like, none of these things are attractive. What are we talking about? So, I think that people like him because he looks different originally. Yeah. And then they're also attracted to him because he's the Dragon Reborn. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like... X Factor. Yeah. I really like... I read When I finished the Dragon Reborn, I mentioned to, to a friend, he was like, oh, you finished the prologue for the Wheel of Time now. These <laughs> these books are basically the prologue before the story starts. I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I can get that impression. Because, like, and this, this comes back to, like, the Matt character. Like, Matt hasn't done anything yet. Mm. Um, I know he will, but, like, when you say about the prologue, that is, it feels very much like he is the, a prologue at the moment. We've not really had any meat to him whatsoever. Mm. And there's a few like that, but so I was talking about Min, and Min is interesting. I like the fact, even though the fact that she can sort of see things, she doesn't mm. necessarily understand what she can see, but she also knows that she kind of doesn't have a choice, that things are happening and she knows they're happening and her part of it is sort of laid out mm. and even though she can sort of see the future she can't necessarily change it or impact it it sort of is what it is um so it's sort of a curse being able to know what the future holds if you can't actually change it or impact mm. it so that's 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 going to be i think it's going to be interesting to see that and obviously her connection now with with rand going forward and what that that means for them, because she knows. I like that she knows she falls in love with Rand, and she's really mad about it. Like that's yeah. that's a great, that's a, a very good joke from Robert Jordan. Yeah. That he's like, oh, she's like, I don't want to fall in love with Rand, and I definitely don't want to have to share him with other women. And you're like, oh, brilliant. <laughs> it's that this goes back as exactly my point that she doesn't have a choice. Like she no. knows what is going to happen because that is the what the wheel has decided so mm. you know fate has decided that and she mm. knows it but she actually can't change it which I again like sort the... of i suppose sort of harks back to sort of the you know the not having control of one's the future you go back to the, sort of the slave elements mm. of lan and you know they're green and domino and not having that control being controlled by outside forces or other individuals mm. anyway sorry you were going to say something I also like that the, her visions have no like self preservation element. Like they don't tell her that they're gonna get that Leandrin's gonna like whip her off. Like there's there's no point where the visions are like, yeah, you know, this Leandrin lady is shady as hell. Um, she's like, yep, yeah, no, I trust her. Let's go. Let's go into the ways. Oh, no. Nothing bad can happen. Ah oh, man. Yeah, yeah. The, and it, 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 that, that was such a frustrating part of that book. Where you're just like, no. Why are you? Why? Why are you all going? <laughs> why are you doing it? Stop! Stop! It's funny because Leandrin's obviously shady, but like you say, because they've been like trained to trust the Aes Sedai. They've yeah. been trained that Red Aja are like different and like not as likable. So yeah, yeah I think more sort of fanatical. I, mean. mm, I think genuinely really interesting in the way that it's it's believable the whole time uh which i really liked wonderful okay so the only i mean the, there were the white cloaks were still in this book but i suppose I th they did have a fairly big bit but they didn't they've got um really? so they turn up at the end don't they but i don't feel like they yeah. make much that there's well, much point in them being there but i think we get to see some POV chapters from uh born hold the general yeah. and i think that those are interesting because it gives you that, like, oh, actually, he's not a fanatic. He's kind of like, mm, there's some stuff going on, and like, I want to try and save people and do the right thing. But then he's got these very fanatical beliefs around Aes Sedai, which are very interesting. Um, yeah, and it's also we've got the white cloaks from the prologue mm. being dark friends going back, you know, and that whole arc, but they don't. It's interesting because it gives us more background and we see, as you say, we see more of them as, rather than just a purely sort of fanatical organisation, there's actually individuals. We start to see an individual mm. nature within that and the extremist views within the group, which aren't shared by all the group. Yeah. Like, I can't remember what the, 
the torturers group is called, but oh, the, the truth questioners, or, questioners. That's it. I was going to say truth seekers. I know it was something other like questioners. Yeah, and sort of their sort of fanatical fanaticism compared to his more normal level of excitement about killing people. Mm. I don't know how to phrase <laughs> it, but you understand know what I mean. Um, the discussions so, are so like sadists, like, whereas he feels more yes. like a he feels more like a soldier. That's yeah. like I will kill people if I have to kill people. Yeah. Whereas, a duty element. yeah. Um, whereas, obviously, the the questioners are very much like we want to torture people, and if we get what we want to know, great. And if we don't, it's fine. We had fun doing it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So I just feel they were a bit sidelined, but it was we got a little bit more from them, but. <laughs> I have to they imagine like that gonna there's going to be, yeah, I have to imagine that one book there, the major antagonist or something yeah. like that coming up. Um, yeah. Or maybe they get converted to be dark friends or vice versa. There's definitely something going on with them. Yeah, there's got to be. There's, Set up. Yeah, there's a, and this is what goes back to my excitement about this series is that there is a lot of things being it feels like there's a lot of things being set up and we're getting a lot of mm -hmm. tastes of things to come but what they actually are we don't know but i'm intrigued and excited to see where it goes and what we what we come across next mm. i'm just checking my notes to check that i haven't missed anything interesting that these were both published the same year yes so either world and the great hunt were both published in 1990 and then um, the Dragon Reborn was published a year later. And I think the speculation was that he had written Dragon Re uh, The Great Hunt and Eye of the World at the same time and then realised they were too long and they had to be two novels instead of one. Yeah, which is why the ending of the first one isn't is, great. Is bad, yeah. Um, but again, yeah. the and ending of the second one is good and the ending of the third one is much improved. Yeah. Like, I would say, almost orders of magnitude better. Yeah, so I think because normally you'd expect the series probably one a year ish, one a year, one every two years mm. at worst. One every year would be better, but yeah, covering out three in a two years is does suggest that he certainly had the first two books written and ready to go. They were published a few months apart, mm. just because the publishing time would have taken book, up a lot. Book of the four other came out a year after book three, but is. Uh, one and a, almost one and a half times the length of book three. Yeah. So book four is where it starts to get real for us. So how how rapid like how rapidly is he? Like, is there is there any point where it sort of takes a break? Because I think that eventually, out, yeah, I think he pumps them out for be... quite a few books. Wow. Um, let me have a look. So he's doing one a year every year for. Uh, so book five, book six yeah we're still one a year up to book six and wow. then there's a two-year gap so okay. he starts to slow down from book six onwards wow that is that is some impressive impressive work I yeah see. i'm genuinely really looking forward to the next one i also i'm looking forward to our chat about the dragon reborn um because i think that there will be a lot I do have it, do have it right here. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I think there's a lot to talk about in this yeah. one, um, more than there is in the first two books. Uh, mm -hmm. Not combined, but the funny thing is also it's the shortest one so far because it's like is under it? 700 pages, whereas the other two are both over 700. That's exciting. It's I short. It's, it's really it's like pacey. All all the chapters are really short. Like most yeah, you of said it. they're all sort of 10, 10, 11 pages or whatever. Yeah, I was lovely. I like that. Absolutely yeah, lovely. It makes it much easier to read it on my commute than um, mm -hmm. I know I can get to the end of a couple of chapters. And ra oh, um, stuck in the Jordan also like shifts POV more often. Okay. So okay. instead of it just being like it's mostly Rand and then there's some yeah. other people every now and then, it's more like we have a chapter from this person and then a chapter from this person and then a chapter from this person or like maybe two or three chapters in a row of one character yeah. but each chapter is like a discrete scene so okay. it's le so instead of having like we're going to spend 17 pages with matt for example 
it's like we're going to have three eight-page chapters with Matt, and when the scene shifts, the chapter changes, which I found much more easy and fun to read. Yeah, yeah, and I think that fits more with how a fair amount of modern fantasy is now written. Yeah, multi well, multi POV modern fantasy obviously is is shorter chapters with lots more switching. Mm between characters to progress the story so it'd be interesting to see how that and I, goes I will warn you I think I got to like 70% and then I read the whole rest of the book in one sitting like 30% <laughs> of this book in one sitting okay. um, like 200 pages I just li I was listening to the audio book and I was just like oh, this is just so good and I was like looking at and I was like oh it's gone midnight and I'm still listening to this audio book and like doing some yeah. like I was playing a puzzle on my tablet like yeah. which is what i often when i listen to audiobooks i often do like pick across puzzles and i was like okay. i'm actually like doing badly at this puzzle because i'm so invested in the book <laughs> um and i think i literally had to be like i have to go to sleep i cannot finish i had three chapters left and it was like um and i was like these are the clearly the climax chapters so yeah. i'm gonna go to bed because okay. i don't want to like be up to 2 a.m and then be like wired because i've just listened to a great book Oh, amazing. Yeah, I'm going to because you're listening, because um, there's two versions, isn't there? Which one are you doing? You're listening to the newer one, aren't you? Yeah, I've listened to the Rosamund Pike version. I'm extremely yeah. sad because she's not done any more. She hasn't more. done them all. No. And um, so each season of the TV show, they have adapted. She's done the audio books that they use to adapt into, those, into the show. So season okay. two of the show is The Great Hunt and The Dragon Reborn kind of right. combined. Yeah. So she's done the audiobook for both of those, but the next season hasn't even started filming yet, and I'm like, oh no, they're not going to get it out. I'm going to have to go to the old audiobooks where I don't like the narrators. Uh, okay. No, I've not listened to any of the audio yet, but I may well pick up some of it as we move through. But, I think um, she is excellent yeah. in yeah. Dragon Reborn. She, I think she really nails it. I think the first two books okay. she was good, but I think she genuinely really nails it. Um, great delivery... Yeah, just genuinely good. Great audio books, okay. great book. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and hopefully we will have our chat in a couple of weeks, towards the end of this month. Hopefully we'll get it done in, in March. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully we'll have a special guest as well. Yeah, yeah. So as long as Ross can finish the book in time, I'm, uh, well, I've, I've got I'm sure you well. will. Got... Yeah. <laughs> Ross has already started. He messaged me oh, last God, night and I'm said... Miles behind everyone. <laughs> He messaged me last night okay, and was let like, me start now. <laughs> I've forgotten everything that happened in Eye of the World and the Great Hunt. So I sent him the massive Discord message that was like, <laughs> it was literally like three phone screens long. That was like all of the, all of the things that had happened. Mm. And then afterwards he <laughs> sent me another question straight away. <laughs> it was like, oh, you didn't miss this. Who's this guy? <laughs> okay. Well, I will, I will crack on with it and make sure mm. I'm, uh, in place by the end of the month to have a chat. So be great prologue us. on this book. Is it? Is it not a great prologue? Is it? Yeah. I do like the prologues. He's he's fantastic. His prologues. Apparently, one of the prologues is um, over ten percent of the book in one of the later books. Wow. It's over a hundred pages. It's just the prologue. And, I, and um, someone was saying to that to me as like a joke, and I was like, honestly, that makes me kind of excited. <laughs> let let Robert yeah. Jordan be weird. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's curious. It's a big old. But yeah, I've enjoyed the first two prologues. Really, like the first first book prologue was a little bit like obviously brand new to it. Didn't know what to expect. Mm. So in the second one, I really enjoyed it because I sort of you have an understanding of the world and it really set the scene and set sort of this dark atmosphere that then led into the books, which I quite enjoyed. So I've enjoyed the prologues first. I'll see what this one's like. But yeah, yeah, hundred page prologue later on. Mm. We'll see, we'll see. That's interesting. That's breaking the mould. I might do is. an entire video on the prologue if it's that long. <laughs> Got to get five videos out a week somehow. If I get if I get one video out a week at the moment, I'm happy. Goodness me. This well, at least we sorted one for you for this week. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's that's that's. <laughs> got some content out. Yeah, exactly. And I've got I've got another one coming out as well. So I'm. Um, okay this week but yeah excellent it's just uh finding the time mm. anyway i will call it there sam thank you very much for joining me yeah uh, hopefully for anybody who's stuck around this long for us babbling away about our enjoyment of the great hunt and i think 
fair to say for both of us it was a step up from the first book and I'm mm. thoroughly looking forward to getting to book three as I say we will have uh, that spoiler chat that will be on Sam's channel hopefully in a couple of weeks towards the end of March maybe very very early April depending on how quickly I read it I promise I'll read it quickly <laughs> you genuinely might I read this the quickest of all the books I think I read this in like four and a bit days Whereas okay. the others, okay. that's a challenge. That is. The others have taken me a full week. That both the first two. So okay, so that means it will take me about two and a half weeks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please do leave your comments in the, down below of what you thought if you've read this book, and please don't spoil book three because I've not read it yet. As I've been very clear in saying, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will see you very shortly. Thank you, Sam. Thanks very much. See you, everyone. Bye.